let's make a start. First of all, good evening to everybody. Um, good to see you all. And uh, this is the second part of a three-part series dealing with Torah and the unborn child. Uh, last week, for those who were on the show last week, we looked at the issue of um, fetal reduction. And we talked about the fetus, if you like, from its implanted stage through till birth. Um, this week, we're going to roll the clock back and look at the issue of embryo selection. So we're still now in the lab. We're before implantation, although we'll see many of the sources that we saw last week, which will be a foundation for us, will be sources that we come back to this week as well. But this week, we're pulling the clock back right to the beginning of fertilization. Next week, in the last of the three, we're going to push the clock forward again to the issue of conjoined twins, a fascinating uh, discussion as to what is the ethical, uh, what ethically is the, correct thing to, is the correct thing to do in order to separate conjoined twins, which is a naturally occurring phenomenon, um, although it can, obviously can be spotted before birth and they will, sometimes will lead to abortions, but in societies or in situations where that's not done, um, when and under what circumstances is it possible to sacrifice one of the conjoined twins to save the other. Normally speaking, as we said, we never take one life to save another. We will kill a fetus to save the mother, but we will never take a life to save a life. Um, and last week we saw whether the fetus was a pre-life, if you like, in Aloka. But with the case of conjoined twins, you're dealing with two very much alive people, sentient, alive people, one of whom is going to be killed to save the other. A very famous case brings in all the issues of uh, the trolley cases as well and saving uh, more people by sacrificing fewer. We'll, we'll talk all about that next week. But this week, we're right at the beginning of fertilization. We're going to talk about embryonic modification, genetic modification, and selection of embryos. So um, what I started with on the sheet today uh, is I popped something in here from a couple of months ago uh, from Science uh, Magazine, where they talked there was a, there was a uh, significant conference and uh, presentation of a report on the, the current, the up-to-date situation on genetic modification of embryos. And I just want to show you a couple of paragraphs from this. This is obviously not a Jewish source, but it brings us up to speed with you know, where things are in this particular area. Um, so in 2018, some of you may be aware, there was a very controversial experiment, which was seen as extremely dangerous, unethical, premature, where a Chinese uh, scientist produced a genetically modified baby. And the babies were actually born. Uh, and this caused an enormous amount of uh, uh, soul searching and ethical questioning. Uh, and this, as I mentioned here, just a couple of months ago, there was a major report. Uh, let me pick up a couple of paragraphs here uh, with you. Here, for more than one year, the International Commission on the Clinical Use of Human G Germline Genome Editing reviewed the scientific literature on CRISPR, which is different ways of cutting and pasting um, uh, genes into chromosomes in, uh, in order to change the, the genetic, the genetic uh, makeup of the baby, and other ways to modify the DNA, held public meetings, webinars, consulted scientists, physicians, ethicists, patient groups. Fine. Organized by the Royal Society in the UK, this is obviously at the highest level, the science and the medicine branches of the US National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, Medicine, the commission aimed to describe a responsible clinical translational pathway that could move genome editing from the lab to assisted reproduction interventions for human diseases. Because at the end of the day, this is what we're talking about today. There are people that need help in conceiving and bringing babies to full term. Um, there are people that carry genetic markers for all number of diseases and hereditary uh, illnesses. And we want to try and help these people, A, to have children that will survive and to have healthy, healthy children that will grow and mature in a healthy way. And this therefore could be an essential science to help them. But where do we draw the lines? And therefore this report suggested six tiers in a hierarchy ranging from the most to the least compelling rationales. So I just wanna look at this first, and then we can contrast that with the classic Jewish position on this as we see in the sources. So just look for a second with me here. So the Genome Editing Commission categorized potential use of HHGE, creating a six level hierarchy that ranges from the most to the least compelling rationales to take risk. And, and then it goes through various different background information. And basically these six levels are as follows. Let me just outline them for you. Uh, the most here, the use of HHGE that is easiest to justify, they said, would be helping those rare couples who even with IVF, 
And screening, even doing IVF and even doing screening, have little or no chance of having a baby that doesn't inherit a genetic condition, Huntington's disease, cystic fibrosis, etc. There are some people that we just can't screen. It won't help. Uh, for these people, maybe genetic modification is desirable. That was the top tier. The second tier, and, and that's, it was understood that this would be a very rare circumstance. Normally, it would be possible to screen and select embryos. But in rare cases, yes, it would be appropriate to actually modify them genetically. Then the second tier here, there are some couples, however, who have a light, high likelihood of PGT failing, genetic testing failing, to giving them an unaffected child. And this is the one exception to the second tier. Okay. The third category of HHG uses is for genetic diseases that have less serious effects, may be corrected or treated like deafness, for which there are alternatives like cochlear implants, meaning as you go down these tiers, it becomes less and less imperative to intervene. Um, would, is it appropriate to take away a gene that will cause deafness in a child? where the child could be born without genetic intervention and have other therapeutic uh, assistance. They could have cochlear implants, they could have operations of different kinds, uh, which, is, which is a preferable approach. That's the third category. Um, then the fourth category, diseases caused by several genes represent the fourth category, which we'll see looking at what happens if this child is carrying a marker for a future disease, the BRCA gene, that might make it more likely that this female child will develop breast cancer at some stage in the future. Maybe, maybe not, but a, a higher likelihood. Is it appropriate to modify uh, embryos to remove those genes to prevent that potential outcome later in life? That's the next level. And then it said here, the fifth level, the most taboo is what they call, you know, designer babies, genetic enhancements of children, resistance to HIV, better at sports, taller, smarter, able to withstand radiation, et cetera, et cetera. And the concern with all of this, just at the last line of this short, short summary, a key danger of editing human embryos is that the unintended, quote, off-target, unquote, DNA changes will occur and not be detected before embryo implantation. What could go wrong? We could end up doing something that was not spotted, and then this child is, rather than being born with an improved health and lifestyle, this, board, this child has been born with a terrible defect caused by the genetic modification. So this, as I say, was not a Jewish source. This is a, the latest or pretty much the latest a few months ago in world thinking on where we should be setting the ethical standards and the different tiers uh, which is appropriate or inappropriate to intervene in genetic modifications. I thought that was a useful uh, starting point so then we can contrast the Jewish position with that. Um, I brought you a little bit on page two, which I'm not getting into now, about how exactly they do germline gene therapy and the differences between that and somatic gene therapy uh, in terms of the ability to inherit and pass on the newly improved uh, the genetic sequencing. But I'm not going to go into that now, partly because I don't want to spend the time on it, partly because I'm not a scientist. You should never learn science from rabbis. You should learn science from scientists and biology from biologists. Rabbis should be talking about Torah. So uh, given this is not my field, uh, I'm not going to get into that much. But I am going to talk a little bit now about the ethical and then the Jewish perspective on this. And this is a real live issue in labs and going forward. So, OK, look, let's look at the ethical issues. Some of the ethical issues raised, I put them on the sheet here, obvious ones. How do we decide between a good and a bad therapy? What is needed and what is more than necessary, what is unnecessary, uh, which traits are normal, what is considered a disability. These are not just Jewish questions, these are general questions. Is having a child with Down syndrome considered a disorder or a disability? So some parents would turn around and say, well, I, I don't really want to have a child with Down syndrome. Other people who are close to people who have Down syndrome, who worked with them and, 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 and developed relationships to them will turn around and say, it's outrageous to, to say that this person somehow has a disorder or, or, or that they're not viable as they are. Why would you want to screen those people away? Um, that's a very pressing question, which has no easy answer. Um, what about the cost of gene therapy? Is that just going to make it available for the rich? So that the rich have the, the designer babies and the poor can have the uh, babies who, are, uh, who have the diseases. That's a concern as well. Um, are we going to become less tolerant to differences if we try to design away these differences? What about, as we said, athletic ability, intelligence? What about screening for sex on the babies, males and females? Is it appropriate to discard a male 
embryos so that we can have a female or the other way around. Uh, and some people are worried that this is just a step towards human cloning. People are gonna be making copies of themselves, which in most cases seems like a bad idea leaving aside the science of cloning. But these are all ethical questions, religious questions, which we'll obviously focus on as a, as a, as a, as a Jewish perspective. People talk a lot about playing God. What does that mean, playing God? When you hear Christian speakers, they say often, no, there's a line. We can't cross that line. This is called playing God. We're not meant to be doing that. We're not meant to be interfering. How do we draw that line? When, when is it called playing God? When is it called helping people? Everything's playing God. You know, if a poor person comes to my house and asks for tzedakah, why don't I turn around to them and say, well, God's made you poor. And who am I to intervene and, and interfere with God's eternal plan? I don't want to play God. If God wants you to have money, then you'll have money. So obviously we don't say that. That's ridiculous. Although we'll see it's not so ridiculous. And we have to explain why that is OK. But where, where are the lines of playing God? What about the hubris and the, and the arrogance of uh, feeling that we're in control of our own uh, destiny, our own future in that way. Uh, and then of course, there's the technical question, what is the status of a fertilized egg? Last week, we looked at a fetus, an implanted fetus, 12, 15, 20 weeks. What about an egg in a lab? Is that different? Is that the same? We'll see in a minute when we go through this. And what are the roles of religious leaders in these areas? What, what voices should we be listening to when we're looking for guidance on this? So uh, my own, uh, I'm close to uh, one of my own tutors from Oxford from many years ago, Ruth Beach, who for many years was the head of the Human Embryology and Fertilization Committee, uh, which dealt with exactly these questions, giving guidance to parliament, uh, guidance to draftsmen as to how to put these laws uh, in place. And what we're gonna look at tonight a little bit is some of the classic sources that deal with exactly these questions, because these are not new questions. This is new technology. But classic sources will give us guidance on these questions as well. So let's have a look together. If anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to take them. Uh, but let's start with a very important point, which is there is a presumption in Judaism that everything is allowed until it's not, rather than everything is not allowed until it is. And that's a very important presumption in how we start. That's a, that's a Mishnah. The Mishnah states in number one, uh, the following. There's a conversation between Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Eliezer ben, ben Azariah. And Rabbi Ishmael challenges Rabbi Eliezer ben Azariah. This is we dating now from the first century CE. As follows, number one. I'm a Rabbi Ishmael. Eliezer ben Azariah, he says to him, Eliezer, Alecha Raya, Lelamed. You have to prove, you're trying to say this is prohibited. The onus of the burden of proof is on you. You are trying to be strict. And it's those who are trying to be strict. They have the burden of proof, not the people who are trying to be lenient. And the Tiferes Yisrael, a classic commentary on the Mishnah, explains what this means. It says, Sorry, I didn't see the screen. Excuse me, forgot to share the screen. So number one. Whenever we don't know a reason to prohibit something, it's automatically permitted. The loy his kira hatorah dvarim hamutarim kulam, because the Torah doesn't come to tell us what we can do; it comes to tell us what we can't do or what we must do, not we, what we can do. Rak dvarim asurim. The Torah comes to to lay down boundaries, but not to say what is permitted in that sense. Everything is presumed allowed until it's not, and therefore our starting point meta halachically has to be that unless we can find a reason that this is not allowed then it is allowed. Um, there's a very famous shuva of Rav Moshe Feinstein in the 1980s, who was dealing with artificial insemination by donor, where a man produces no sperm, we'll see, or non-viable sperm, we'll come back to that later. And the only way that the couple can have a child is by an, a, a sperm donation. And uh, there was a debate at the time, is this okay, is this not okay, can you get a sperm donor from a non-Jewish donor? It's actually far preferable from a non-Jewish donor. And Rav Moshe Feinstein said it's, it's permitted. There's no reason why this is prohibited in a situation where a Jewish family is trying to start a family. And a number of Rabbonim, even though Rav Moshe Feinstein was extremely respected back in the 1970s, 80s, this was the early 80s, came out and said, this is outrageous. The Rav Yaakov Breisch in Switzerland said, even the Catholics don't allow this. Even the Catholics say this is prohibited. And Rav Moshe wrote back to him and said, well, excuse me, you know, with all due respect to the Catholics, why does that impact on me? It's nothing to do with the Catholics, whether the Catholics allow it or don't allow it. I'm looking at the Torah sources, and unless the Torah says it's prohibited, then it's permitted. 
It's very interesting that Rav Moshe, very famous speech of Rav Moshe, I believe in Torah and only Torah, etc. And when you read that out of context, you think that he's speaking, I don't know, to some secular audience or to a reform audience or something. No, he's actually speaking to a Hasidic um, Poisek rabbi in Europe who is trying to tell him that he can't do this. And he's saying, why not? I can do it. If the Torah says it's, uh, if the Torah doesn't say it's not allowed, it is allowed. That's a very important starting point. Hashkafically also, um, our attitude towards innovation is very important too. And this is where there's a divergence. And this is why you'll see different voices on these kind of issues. Quite famously, the Khatam Sofer um, in the early 1800s uh, in Europe, of, um, uh, the Khatam Sofer was his first name, of Moshe, of Moshe Sofa, uh, he came out with a very famous statement. He says, number two, in one of his tshuvas, Israel, we shouldn't be terrorizing, frightening the Jewish people with all these new things, any which our fathers never dealt with. They already said this, and this is a play on words. He says, Hachadash asur min Torah New things are prohibited. We don't do new things. Now, this is interesting because uh, he's obviously using this phrase. It's you talking about chadash in a technical sense, which is the new crop, uh, which is not allowed until after Pesach. That's obviously where he's getting that from, but he's using this to express an idea which was very dominant in the Orthodox world, certainly in the ultra-Orthodox world in Europe in the 19th century, that where possible, we try not to innovate new things that we never did before. He's not anti-technology. That's very important. In fact, the Hassan Sofa was one of the first people to actually approve the use of the Shabbos clock, as the timer on Shabbos. Of course, in the early 1800s, they didn't have timers. But what he did have, he saw someone came to him and said, what if we light a fuse and a very, very slow burning fuse on Friday afternoon before Shabbos? And it slow burns all the way through Friday night to Shabbos morning. Shabbos morning, it'll hit some kindling, like the little kindling the wood, and it'll boil up a pot of coffee for Shabbos morning before davening. Is that okay or not okay? And he embraces that. He says, no, that's not a problem. He's not anti-technology, but he is worried about new ideas, new innovations in Torah, new directions, because obviously he's fighting the reform, the early nascent reform movement, and therefore he set a much more conservative, little c, tone to the debate, as opposed to Rav Cook, who lived around 100 years later, Rav Cook had a completely different perspective. A famous quote from him in number three, just a one-liner, Hayashan Yitchadesh, that which is old will be renewed, the Hachadash Yitchadesh, and that which is new will be sanctified. For Yachtav and together, orim al Zion, they will be beacons of light for Zion, for the Jewish people and for the world. Meaning, Rav Kook was very, uh, very um, excited to embrace that which is new and sanctify it. Uh, and there's a lot more to say about that. We could give an entire series on the, the Hashkafic thinking of the Hassan Sofa, as opposed to the Hashkafic thinking of Rav Kook and how those two things came together. In the modern world that we live in, to some degree, to some degree, they are part of the reason for the debate between the Haredi Yeshivish world and the modern Orthodox and religious Zionist world. They're, they are the inheritors in many ways of these ideas. But it's important here to see that there are different ways of looking at this. But generally speaking, we are pretty pro-intervention. And like I said before, we're not worried about playing God. That's not a Jewish concern, prima facie. Look at number four. Number four is an important classic source. The Gemara sets up certain sort of debates in the mouthpieces of Turnus Rufus, who is a Roman uh, general, and Rabbi Akiva. And whether they ever had these exact debates is a good question, but the Gemara presents these arguments through the medium of, of these two people. So he, the, the Romans said to Rabbi Kiva, if God really loves the poor people, why doesn't he give them money? You claim God loves the poor as well as the rich? Well, it doesn't look like it. He doesn't give them anything. So Rabbi Kiva said to him, I'll tell you why they're poor. So we can give charity and we can gain merit and help them at the same time. And it's good for us as well that we help them and they help us. We all help each other. So Amalek, he said to him, I don't buy that. I don't buy it. Adarabba. You should go to Gehenna. You should go to hell for helping them. I'll bring you a parable, says the Roman. What is it like? 
Let's say a king was angry with a servant, and he locked him in prison. And he said, no one can bring them food, no one can bring them drink. And one guy came behind the scenes and gave him food and drink. When the king hears, will he not be infuriated? You've gone against my wishes. And he says, you are called the servants of God. Eved Hashem, Shenehmar, Kili Bana Yisrael Avadim, Pasukim Vayikra, and and God has said this servant of mine has to have no money. <clears throat> How dare you give them money? God will be very angry with you, surely. So Rabbi Kiva says, no, you've got completely the wrong end of the stick. He says, I'm Shalacham Hashem. I'll give you a parable back. Lema David It's more similar to the following. Lemelech Basav Adam Shekas Al Benoi. A king is angry with his son, his family member, and he puts him in prison to teach him a lesson, and he commands no one should give him food or drink. Then if somebody goes and gives them food or drink, when the king hears, he's going to be quite relieved. He's going to say, Baruch Hashem, or whatever kings say, uh, and uh, he'll be pleased about it. We're called the children of God. We're not just called the servants of God. Meaning the point of being called Banim means we're family. This is my family. This is not just a random person. And we are all children. The God, in, in, in Shemot, the Pashas we're reading now in, the, in Shul, if, we, if we're in Shul, that's a whole different story, um, are talking about the Jewish people as the firstborn and all the non-Jewish nations of the world as the siblings. That's the, that is the model that the Chumash paints, that we're all related, everybody. And therefore, if we help each other, this gives nachas to Hashem. This doesn't give uh, pain or anguish to Hashem. It's as so far as we understand how this all works. And therefore, we are very pro the idea of innovating. If, if we can make the world a better place, if we can help people, that is what we're meant to be doing. And if we can help a couple by doing something which is technologically possible and not prohibited, and it's not prohibited unless it is prohibited, like I said before, the default is it's permitted, then why would we not do that? We want to help people. Secondly, we firmly believe that the world that we live in needs to be fixed. Tikkun olam. Tikkun olam became a very big rallying cry for the conservative movement. And there's nothing wrong with tikkun olam. This is actually a fundamental Jewish idea. Look at number five. Philosoph echad sha'al et Rabbi Hoshaya. A philosopher asked Rabbi Hoshaya. Amali said to him, if Mila, if God wants bris mila, God wants someone to be circumcised. Why wasn't man created circumcised? If God loves that, that idea, why would we have to do it? Why, why can't God create a perfect world? So Amalek says to him, no, don't you see? Everything created in the first six days of creation needs tweaking, needs fixing. And he gives examples, almost trivial ones. Uh, the mustard needs a little bit of sweetening. Turmusim, you know, peas need a little bit of salt, whatever it is, an egg needs a little bit of salt. Everything needs a little bit of improvement in order to make it optimal. So too, Afilo Adam, even a person, Tzarech Tikkun, needs a person. We have to be partners with God in making that Tikkun, in making that um, correction and improvement. And so too, we shouldn't feel that it's somehow impinging on playing God that we're changing the world. No, God made the world imperfect so that we can perfect it. That's fundamental Jewish philosophy. So, so far we've seen a number of key underlying ethical points here. Number one, everything is permitted until it's clearly not. Number two, we are in this to help people. That is a prime directive, if you like, that we have to, to, to intervene wherever possible to help people. And three, we believe that the world is in need of fixing and we wish to be partners with God in creation in making the world a better place. Okay, so these are these are underlying features which will obviously influence the way that we look at this halakhically and hashkafically. Next, mankind was put into the world with a mandate in the bracious. Look in number six. God blessed Adam and Chava, the Yom Elahem, and he said to them, Pru Ruvu. This is actually before Chava was named Chava, but when man and woman were created, he said, Go and multiply. Milu et it's fill up the world, the kivshuha, and conquer it. Uridu, and be in charge of, take responsibility for, the gatayam, the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, etc. And I'm not going to read you all of Source 7, but he talks there about this being a mandate to mankind to innovate in the world, to create in the world, to enable him to fully benefit from the world. 
because the world was cre created in a, in a state of potential that can be adapted in order for mankind to fully, uh, to fully use it as long as he doesn't abuse it. And that's the line, the boundaries that we need to try and, uh, that we need to try and see, because there have to be some boundaries. We've seen that, that exploitation of the world, of the planet, of the climate, et cetera, will just lead to ultimate destruction. And mankind does not always have the ability to self-impose these boundaries. So where will the Torah put boundaries on what we can and can't do in terms of genetic modification uh, and such like? <clears throat> so the first major boundary is the definition of healing. Um, in order to intervene medically, there has to be an element of refu'ah. And this is going to be a blurred line. It's not going to be an easy line to draw. But uh, we learn this from a verse in, uh, in Shemot, when two men are fighting. Look at number eight. Ki ruvun anashim, if two men are fighting. Behika ish et when one hits the other, be'even with a stone, be'egrof or with a fist. The loyamut, he doesn't die. It's not a murder case. But he has to go to hospital. Imiakum, when he eventually gets up, meaning he's not going to die. If he dies, then that's murder, obviously. Imiakum If he manages to get out and about, al misha'anta on his crutches, v'nikamaka, the person who hit him is innocent of murder. Rak, but shivtoi he has to give him compensation for lost earnings while he's been sitting in hospital, uh, not being able to work. V'rapo yirape, and he must get ensure that he's healed. He must pay his medical bills. He has to make sure that this person is healed. He's responsible for giving him the, the uh, putting him in hospital. He has to heal him, as it were, monetarily. And here, famously, the Gemara says, these words, he will surely be healed. This is where we see this permitted to, to intervene, to, uh, to, uh, to heal other people. I'll just mute everybody so that we get a bit of quiet there, thanks. Uh, so this is where we see that we have the not only the ability, but the mandate for rapport y repair to actually heal. Rashi says, we don't say, God made him sick, let God make him well. That's not what we say. We intervene, rapport y repair. So as long as we can define something as healing, then that's going to be okay. So Obviously, somebody who is going to have a baby who is has an illness, a sickness, mortality, morbidity, whatever it is, clearly that is healing on the one hand. On the other hand, somebody who wants a blue eyed baby rather than a brown eyed baby or a tall baby rather than a shorter baby so they can be athletic. Clearly, that's not healing. And everything else in between those will be on one side of the line or the other. And we're going to have to decide what that is. But that's a fundamental. We are encouraged to intervene, but only if it's a case of bona fide refuah. That's one boundary that we're going to need to, to, to define. A second boundary is that we are told that there are certain mitzvahs that are given to us that potentially will restrict the amount that we intervene in nature. Uh, what are these mitzvahs? One of them suggested is the mitzvah of kishuf, Kishav, I brought you number 10, is the mitzvah of, um, of witchcraft. And one of the explanations given by the, the uh, Sefer HaChinuch on, on the issue of the reason for the, the mitzvah of witchcraft is that, that, that God has set a certain natural order. And if you go beyond the natural order into some kind of supernatural world, which is was perceived as the world of witchcraft, that is a boundary that you're not allowed to overstep. In reality, that's not actually relevant to our case for all sorts of reasons. First of all, many of the classic post games said, look, the whole of witchcraft is just nonsense anyway. The Rambam clearly and many others that went in his, uh, in his derech, in his way, said that witchcraft is simply a sham. It's a way that people try and persuade gullible people that they're able to control forces. It's just, uh, you know, there's one born every minute and all of these occults and witchcraft forces, says the Rambam, are simply nonsense. Others say, no, there is a dark side, but everybody will agree that what you're doing in a lab in a natural way is never gonna be prohibited. If you're doing something which is clearly scientific, clearly not uh, in any way supernatural, then there's gonna be no issue there. Anyway, that is a clear dividing line, as indeed is healing. If you look at number 11, a very important statement, a buyer of a rubber, the Amit who both a buyer and rubber said, kal dava sheyesh mishum Anytime that somebody is doing something for bona fide refuah, 
We're not so worried about uh, slightly uh, like avoda zora or idolatrous ideas. We're less worried about that because they we can see that they're generally doing it for the purposes of healing and it's part of a natural means. Um, and the Meiri stresses this as well. The Meiri actually fascinatingly, 700 years ago, says even if we're able to create a child naturally, but not through a mother and father, that will still be okay. That's an amazing statement from somebody living in the 13th, 14th century in Southern France. Look at what he says here. Anything we do through natural means, is not called witchcraft. And he's on the right side of the line. Even if we work out how to create life, shalom is come in without sexual intercourse between a male and a female. Even if we find some um, synthetic way to produce life, artificial way. We're allowed to do that. So this idea of witchcraft is, is not really going to be a problem for us because everything that we do obviously is natural and will therefore be in that sense on the right side of the line. Okay, that's the first potential issue. Somebody sent in a question here. Um, so let me address it now, unless I'll forget it. The Jewish people lived in a nation that set rules regarding the type of person that is ideal, physically athletic, gender, great eyesight. We can alter embryos to keep the child safer in the society and make life easier. And how do we view it into Judaism? So that's a really interesting question. You know, life will be, you're saying maybe that is on the right side of healing. It'll, the child will be able to cross the road. He won't need. Uh, he won't need to squint. He'll be able to to whatever. Be a bit more physically powerful. This could save him from diseases. So you know, as we go down that line, it'll be less and less. As we saw with the the, the, the piece at the beginning, less and less able to make that case. I think it's a little bit. A little bit hypothetical. This, it's also a God forbid. You know, like if you're in a nation whose laws. Look, we know that in China they wanted boys over girls. Like right. that's very, but let's say that you're in a society that um, you know has particular views on a particular, you know, humans that are taller or humans that right. are right. the gender, right. and, and the laws mean that it's much easier for a particular child over another. Yes. In their life. Do we view it as a as a like you would view a disease in our society now that we can prevent? Would you view it in a similar way? It's a good question. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, maybe if that was the only way that we could survive, because, you know, like the case of Paro, let's take the case of Paro. He's going to throw all of the boys in the river and the girls will survive. If they could genetically uh, select out all of the boys and only have girls, would that be preferable? Of course it would, because he's going to kill all the boys, clearly. Um, so in an extremist case like that, I agree with you. Or maybe the answer in China will be, well, why are you living in China? Go move somewhere else. Maybe you can't. Maybe you're stuck. I agree with that. And like someone just wrote here, this is the this is the, the classic question. It starts with cancer and heart disease. And you go down at a certain point, you cross a line which is no longer called refua or necessary, etc. Where is that line? It's not going to be clear. Obviously, intelligence, people who have more intelligence, uh, you would have thought anyway, are more likely to do well in society. It doesn't always work that way. Um, can you therefore scream for that? Don't forget, it's not just a neutral act. You're throwing away embryos. You're discarding fertilized embryos in order to choose these ones. And therefore, we're not just going to be able to do this for any random reason. We're going to have to have a justifiable reason to do it because we'll see an embryo is not a life, but it is something. It is a potential life and therefore can only be discarded if there's a justifiable reason to do that. So let's put aside witchcraft. We're not really interested in that. Another possible mitzvah which is raised as maybe uh, putting a boundary on this is kilayim. There is a prohibition on mixing certain things. And again, the Sefer Achinuch said, uh, you can't mix wool and linen, you can't mix certain, uh, crossbreed certain species, you can't crossbreed certain trees. That's because God put a limit on what is the natural world. And this, these are the species that exist. We're not meant to be making other species apart from these. And uh, that's really a, a difficult boundary to, to draw as well. And Rav Cook talks about that between enhancing nature and undermining or changing nature. The truth is though, that is not really a, 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 a halachic idea. That's more of a hashkafic idea because kilayim, there are many other potential reasons for kilayim, uh, uh, added to which 
Kilayim only binds the Jewish world. The non-Jewish world is not prohibited from crossbreeding animals or crossbreeding trees. By the way, it's just an interesting, coming up to Tubishvat, there are all sorts of fascinating halachas, nothing to do with the shear, of crossbreeding trees. Are you allowed to, are you even allowed to own a crossbred tree? We actually have in our garden, uh, just in parentheses, something called a fruit salad tree. A fruit salad tree is a citrus tree, which has been crossbred to grow different kinds of citrus on it. You can have five or six different, you can have lemons and, and, and grapefruits and oranges and tangerines and all sorts of things. Uh, we only have two. And the question is, are you allowed to have that kind of tree in the garden? Or do you have to uproot it and throw it away? So I looked into this when we bought the house that was there and you are allowed to keep it for all sorts of reasons, which I'm not going into now. But I'm just saying, Kilaim, is this something which will uh, limit us? A couple of questions came in here. Um, can you keep the rest frozen forever? Well, obviously not forever, but for a long time. And CRISPR avoids the issue. Yes, that's the point. CRISPR will avoid the issue because you'll be able to modify rather than discard the, gene, the, the embryo. But is that going to potentially cause more problems down the line? We'll see that when we get uh, we get through. He, someone pops here 10 years in the UK is standard, but I'm sure they'll be able to extend that um, uh, as we get uh, further through in technology. Let's talk about changing nature where those boundary lines might be. Because I keep saying that there's a line somewhere. Let's see if we can draw that line. I want to contrast to you two sources. And these are very interesting classic sources. Remember the Greek myth of Prometheus, that the gods have fire and Prometheus um, breaks in, if you like, to the realm of the gods and he steals fire and he brings it back down to earth. There is a Midrashic idea, Rabbi Sachs, I remember hearing him talk about this. There's a Midrashic idea which directly speaks to the question of Prometheus. Prometheus is a certain attitude to technology, that the gods have technology and there are certain things we just can't get. The Jewish response to that is the following Midrash, quite famous, well-known Midrash, number 15. The Tani Rabbi Yosei Omer, Shnei Dvarim Alu B'machshava Li'ibarot, the Erev Shabbos. There are two things which were, could have been, were in God's mind, meaning potentially they were there in creation, but not yet brought out. They could have been made on, on Friday, in the six days, meaning part of the creative process. The Loi Nivra Ad Moshe Shabbos, but they were left over for man to do them on Moshe Shabbos. It's man's job to create these things. What were they? But Moshe Shabbos, not on Akadosh Baruch Hu, on on the Saturday night, God put into the the mind of mankind a an idea, an insight, an understanding. Me'ain dug Mashalmana to make him creative in the way that God is creative, a reflection of God's creative ability. And what did man do? The Hevi Shnei Avanim V'Tachna and Zobazo. He brought two stones, banged them against each other the Yatzimehem or and made fire, which is, you see, God is helping man in this Midrash to develop the technology. He's not stealing it from the gods. And the second one, the Hevi Shtei Behemoth, he brought two animals, a horse and a mule, a horse and a donkey, the Hirkiv Zobazar, and he they crossbred them together, the Yatzimehem Parit, and he actually created a mule. Now, we are not allowed to do that for halachic reasons because crossbreeding is prohibited. But here it's saying Adam Harishan, who was obviously not Jewish, um, he was able and not only able, but encouraged and God gave him the insight to do this. Here you see a very fascinating midrashic, if you like, green light to say that there are certain things that you can do that, that weren't in creation, but you should be doing. <clears throat> and one of them is creating new forms of life. That's a, that's a positive angle on that. But then there's a negative angle on that. You see, the, 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 the Chazal, the rabbis, don't speak with one voice. <clears throat> the Bavli gave it this very positive attitude. But then look at this. This is a, this is a verse in, in Sefer Bracious that you probably don't remember reading. It's obscure and it's tucked away there. Number 16. The, when it's going through all of the, the uh, kings of Seir and the, the relations of Esav at the end of Parshas Vayishlach, it says the following line. The Eila Bnei Tzivon. These are the sons of Tzivon, the Aya, the Anna. These are the two, Aya and Anna. Who Anna, this guy Anna, <coughs> it's a man's name, is the person, Asher et He found, he crossbred and created mules, Bamidbar. Bira Oisa, it's a Chamorim, when he was, when he was uh, um, pasturing his father's donkeys, Litzivon Avi, for his father. He created this species. He was able to do that. Okay, isn't that what mankind is meant to be doing? Again, that's, a, that's not a midrash, that's a verse in, in the Chumash. So the Yerushalmi brings out here and he says, actually what he did is he did something wrong. He wasn't meant to be doing this. 
Um, uh, here, looking at number 17, the parallel midrash to the one we saw in the Bavli. Ha'esh v'hakilayim, fire and crossbreeding, it's obviously the same midrashic idea, even though they weren't created by God in the six days. They were potentially built in. They were there in potential. And then he brings the example of Kilaim and he talks about this Pasuk. And then he says, God responded to this man, Anna, who did this. God said to this person, you have done something in the world which is potentially very dangerous here. You've crossed the boundary. I'm going to show you how dangerous that is and bring you And then what says this Midrash happened? He took a snake. And he bred, crossbred it with a toad. And, and, and created this very highly poisonous and very dangerous lizard. Now, again, this is a midrash. I'm not suggesting for one minute that this is something that happened in real time. But what the rabbis are doing here is they're using this idea to, to express this ethical, philosophical question, which is there can be a point when you try to intervene too far and you create a monster. You can create a monster in the process. And once you've opened Pandora's box, then you can't get the genie back in the bottle to use a terrible mixing of metaphors. But this is a potential problem. So you see already that the, the Bavli's presentation of this Midrash and the Yerushalmi's presentation of this Midrash set two sides of the coin. On the one hand, God wants man to be creative, to help, to build the universe, to, to crossbreed animals, to make new ideas. On the other hand, God says to him, whoa, just make sure that you don't create a monster in the process. And I, I just find that the, 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 the conversation between those two Midrash, the same Midrash, but expressed by two different voices, is giving that, is giving that balance on the question. Again, where it's drawing the line is not clear, because that line will be different in different situations, but it's expressing the, 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 the sensitivities, if you like, on each side of the line. Um, so too, there is a Midrash in Nida, that talks about the idea that there are three partners in creation. There's the man, and there's the woman, and then there's God. And that each of them has a certain amount to contribute to that, and has to understand that they cannot uh, overstep that mark, and they cannot give God's part, or the man cannot give the woman's part, or the woman gives the man's part. Um, exactly, though, where that draws the line halakhically is not clear, but again, it's saying that there are different contributors, and we have to understand the boundaries. What is the status of an unimplanted embryo? We saw last week that a fetus is less than a full life, but it nevertheless is a potential life to the point that Rav Moshe Feinstein, who maybe is a minority position, even felt it was murder to kill a, a fetus in utero once it was implanted. And certainly we saw that the, uh, the, the halakhi position for a non-Jew killing a fetus is it's definitely considered to be murder for a non-Jew to kill a fetus. Um, is that going to be true of an embryo in the lab? And again, last week we said that it can't really be murdered to kill a fetus entirely in the, in the full sense because you are obligated to kill the fetus to save the mother. And we would never normally kill, a, kill one person to save another. But nevertheless, it is something, you know, a loss of potential life. It's, what about... An embryo in the lab. So if you here look at uh, source number 19, I think this is the key source here, that we looked at this briefly last week, the Gemara says clearly that before 40 days of gestation, what you're dealing with is, is fluid. It is still potentially a life. Yes, it is. And we don't treat it as a zero. It's certainly more than a sperm. A sperm is could be turned into a life with a lot of different interventions. This is a lot closer to that. And we would not waste it for no reason, but we would be prepared to waste it if there was a reason. Uh, Looking number 19, Amor of Chizda, Ad Arbaim, until 40 days, Maya Baalma Gi. It is just fluid, it's just water. It's not even yet considered to be a fetus. So too, the Postic, the verse that dealt with a non Jew killing a fetus, and we saw this verse last week that if you, if you, Shofech Dam Ha'adam, Ba'adam, if you, if you spill the blood of, an, of a person within a person, obviously that's a drash, that's not a pshat, that's not a straightforward meaning of the verse, but if you spill the blood of a person within a person, then that is considered for a non-Jewish person to be murdered, one of the seven mitzvahs of B'nai Noach. But again, an embryo in a lab is not yet a person within a person. 
it is a potential person in a, in a, in a Petri dish or in a freezer. And therefore, we will, the, the post scheme across the board do not treat um, embryos in an unimplanted state in the same way as they do fetuses. Yes, they are a potential life, and yes, they cannot be discarded for no reason at all. Uh, but for good reasons, and we'll see, therapeutic and health reasons, they can certainly, uh, they can certainly be discarded if, discarded if there's a reason to do that. Uh, and uh, we'll see soon many of the situations in which that comes up. In terms of screening and selection, so when it comes to modification, we, we've, we've brought the two sides of the coin. On the one hand, on the other hand, yes, we're interventionists. Yes, we wish to heal, but not go beyond healing and the dangers involved. We looked at that and we'll have to find that balance within those sensitivities. When it comes to screening, then it's much easier because there's no real reason why a person cannot screen as long as there is a uh, a, a medical or a halachic or a shalom bias reason in terms of the husband and wife, and we'll, we'll deal with some of those in a minute, why screening may be appropriate. Um, so why would screening be allowed by the post scheme? Uh, certainly for genetic abnormalities, that will be uh, acceptable. The healthy embryos can be implanted and the, uh, the defective embryos can be in that situation discarded because again, their status is a lot lower in halacha. Uh, what is an abnormality? Tay-Sachs is an obvious example. Again, what about Down syndrome? Uh, there will come a point at which you will say, well, that, that's really not something that is considered an abnormality or, or something that uh, Tay-Sachs is very different to Down syndrome in terms of the, the quality of life of the child and the relationship with the parents. They will be less clear. Um, what about other situations? Uh, what about if the parents want a child with an abnormality? Is that acceptable? What, what, what could the case be? Um, what if two deaf parents say, well, actually we want a child who's deaf because they will be able to relate to each other much more uh, or two very small parents want a child who's very small. Is that even a dwarf kind of small? Is that, is that acceptable or is that not acceptable? Is that creating people who are objectively unwell in some way um, just because the parents want that? But on the other hand, the parents are saying, for us, that makes a lot more sense. And, you know, you need to respect our wishes. That's a difficult case. At what point do we say, Shomer Pesayim Hashem? I wrote this here at the top of page seven. Shomer Pesayim Hashem is a very important principle, which is a posik in Tehillim, a verse in Tehillim that said, God protects the simple. Meaning there are certain risks in life which are inherent to life. There's not much we can do to hedge them. And if it's a normal, reasonable risk that normal, reasonable people take, then we should not try to avoid that risk if there is a significant downside. Meaning I don't have to get in a car. People die, God forbid, in car accidents all the time. I can avoid that entirely by never getting in a car. But it's a normal risk to get in a car, to drive around. And therefore, halachically, even if you tell me that the risk of being hurt in a car accident, God forbid, is higher than the risk of being hurt in a skydiving accident, it still may be halachically permitted to drive a car, but not necessarily halachically permitted to dive out of a plane. Now, I'm not telling you that you can't go skydiving. I'm not, I'm not a halachic posek, and you, it depends on the circumstances. But the point is, is this a normal risk? Normal risks have to be borne with a certain level of Bitachon, with confidence that we can't predict the future. There's all sorts of things that can go wrong and we have to accept those risks. So maybe the BRCA gene is the same thing. Maybe to discard an embryo because you think there's a risk that in life, future, in the future, maybe this would, well, maybe not. And, and how can you tell which diseases, there are people that have developed diseases through life that has spurred them on to make foundations and raise enormous amounts of money for, for, for medical research and find cures for those diseases. Would you say, would it have been better for that child or that person never to have been born, never to have had that disease, even though that means that all the good that came out of that would not have been done? These are impossible questions to answer, but they may come into this this, this, this calculation of Shomer Pesayim Hashem. At a certain point, I have to say, you know something, I can't hedge every risk. There are certain inherent risks to life and we have to be prepared to take them. Not sure where that line goes, but there are all sorts of uh, considerations there as well. Um, 
Let's talk about choosing sex of the child just for a few minutes. Is it legitimate to screen for, for gender? I'd like a boy, I'd like a girl. What are the halachic scenarios? So there are some very real scenarios. Let's talk about a few. Um, the obvious one where is a person says, you know, I've got six girls, Baruch Hashem, and I love that, or I've got six boys, but I want to do the mitzvah for a pruravu. Pruravu requires me to have at least one boy, one girl, and therefore I want to screen in order to do that. That may be quite legitimate, and in Israel, that is considered legitimate, and you can get that screening um, if you've had a certain number of one sex child and then you want the other one, because again, that is uh, considered to be a halachic uh, reason as well. Um, what happens if the father is a Cohen and has no sperm, and therefore they need artificial insemination by donor? which is legitimate, according to many posts, and we saw the Rav Moshe Feinstein I mentioned before, but, the, but that child's not going to be a Cohen, and that's going to be very embarrassing, because everyone for the rest of their lives is going to be saying, how come you're a Cohen, but your son's not a Cohen? How did that happen? And of course, they don't want to get into that argument, so they say, we'd actually rather have a girl. We'd rather have a girl, um, and uh, that we're not getting into these issues, because there won't be a, a, a significant difference of, uh, between the father and the son. So is that a reason to have a girl, not a boy? Um, what about another case? Let's say a non cone the father has no sperm and he needs artificial insemination. But let's say the family are concerned that since he's not the father of the child, there may be a shomenagia issue. Now, that, this is a bigger issue. Uh, are you allowed to touch a child who is adopted or hug them or kiss them? According to many persons, the answer is yes, you can. Um, the Lubavitcher Rebbe was particularly strict on this. Uh, Rav Moshe Feinstein was lenient on this. But let's say a person said, well, I'd rather have a boy then. So we don't get into that whole issue. Is that a legitimate reason for screening out? So these are all things that can happen uh, halachically uh, in terms of trying to work all of this out. These are, these are real halachic scenarios. Um, the last things I brought here, I'll just give one last, uh, one last guidance here and then maybe open for some questions. Somebody made a point about the Yerushalmi. Okay, Pru Ravu, but we pass it like the Babli that it's a boy and a girl. Was my tree crossbred or grafted? It was actually grafted, I must tell you. Um, it, it had a stock. And then another, another, another tree was put into it. And uh, if you want to have a picture of my fruit salad tree with its grapefruits on one side and its oranges on the other, then just send me a WhatsApp and I'll be very happy to send you a picture through. And uh, I'm very excited. I just saw today it's got a lot of blossom. Um, hopefully we'll end up with a, with a crop next year as well. But there's a, lot, there's a lot that could go wrong before that happens. Last point, then we'll finish with here because it's, uh, it's pretty late already. Um, Rav Avram Steinberg, a very senior medical figure himself, a professor of medicine, very senior halachic figure, um, he sets out a three-part test as to what is and what isn't legitimate medical intervention. And his three parts are basically as follows. I'll just show you on the screen at the very the, the last page of the sheet. He says basically as follows. Question number one is, is what we're about to do itself objectively halachically prohibited? If it is, then we can't do it. That, that's the first question. But we've seen that many things are not halachically prohibited, and we don't say it's prohibited unless we know it's prohibited. But the first question is, is it halachically prohibited? Question number one. Qu question number two, will it have a secondary consequence, perhaps unintended, which is also halachically prohibited? That's another problem that may arise. And if it will, then that's a reason not to do it too. And thirdly, and this is the balancing act, is there an overall benefit to this activity, which is not outweighed by the damage or potential damage which is caused by it. And of course, then you'll have to weigh up the risk. There is a, there's a definite upside and there's a potential downside. What if the potential downside is bigger than the definite upside? So these, these things are difficult to weigh up. But this, this is basically the test that he gave. But again, the first part of that test is halakhically yes or no. And we've seen here, really, it's not the halacha that is stopping us really from doing this. It's more the sensitivities and the hashkafic ideas. Therefore, I'd like to suggest to you that actually halakhically and hashkafically, there's a lot of latitude for genetic screening for sure of embryos uh, and genetic modification yes within the boundaries that we've said and we'll have to see which way that goes but I don't think that if we do develop a science which legitimizes genetic modification in certain situations I don't think that anyone is going to have a major halakhic or hashkafic problem with that ultimately.
We'll see. I may be wrong. Uh, next week's case is much harder, which is the conjoined twins, because there you're actually actively killing a live human being in order to save another one. Uh, and that we'll have to talk about next week. But any any questions? Let's bring this to a close. Hi, Rob, I have a question. Yes, Ilan, nice to speak to you. Nice to speak to you. Um, so with um, Tay-Sachs, um, could we argue that not only is it um, permitted to do embryo screening, but given the um, horrific nature of the disease and the current lack of any sort of treatment, that yes. it would actually be a, a vera if one would deliberately conceive knowing that they were both carriers and therefore had a 25% chance yes. of having a child with Tay-Sachs? Yes, possibly, because and one of the things I brought on the sheet that I didn't mention now uh, is that there is a mitzvah of loisamod al damriecha you may not stand by while other people will suffer if you could do something to prevent that suffering. The question is, does that apply to a human being who has not yet been born? It would certainly apply to a person who is around, but uh, I think there's a very good argument, yes, to say that if you have in front of you two embryos, one of which you know will have Tay-Sachs and one of which you know will not, to, to, to purposely bring a child into the world with Tay-Sachs could well be a violation of Loisam or Damriecha that you are causing unnecessary suffering when that, that suffering was not, was not could have been avoided. Uh, but also, you could argue different ways, yes. You've got like yeah. two halachic ways that you could do it. Like you could go through the whole palaver of embryo screening, which does involve IVF and all of the side effects yes. of the, you know, and the expense and the heartache involved as it's not a very, you know, it's not, it's only about between 20 and 40% effective. Um, or you could just get a sperm donor. Yes. Yes, that's a good question, uh, and that will depend on the case. Uh, if you follow a, a halakhic perspective that a sperm donor is prohibited, uh, then you won't get a sperm donor. But if you follow the view of Rav Moshe, and I think many of the post that an extremist that it is, then fine. But Rav Moshe Feinstein's tshuva was he allowed an artificial insemination by donor when this was the only way that you could create a family for this family unit. And back in the 1970s, 80s, that was the only way. So if there is another way, so then you'll have to ask, well, what is what is the reality of that other way? You tell me it might not work and it's extremely expensive and it'll it'll cause hardship to the. OK, so that's it's not be just a, hardship. We're talking about medical risk. Right. Medical risk. Good. So that's going to be a case to weigh up the 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 uh, the doctors the, the are going to have to come in and say, what are the risks? What are the upsides? What are the downsides? Um, and, you know, if it's considered to be too risky, whatever that means for that person, then maybe AID is the answer. But I think it's going to be very case by case, you know, situation in, in a wealthy family with a low medical risk, then you may turn around and say, well, why would you get a sperm donation? You don't need to. But with a with a with a non wealthy family with a significant medical risk, it might be different. I don't know. I think it'll be very much case by case. It's, it Rav Moshe is really feels that this is the last resort to get a non Jewish sperm donor. If it's really if you only really have to. But uh, sometimes you have to. Why would and, it have and, to be non Jewish? Because if it's a Jewish sperm donor, you get issues of consanguinity and, and people might be related and you don't have a donor and it may be someone, you know, but so you can assume that a, a sperm donation is a non-Jewish donor because uh, most donors, just numbers wise, probably, you know, societally, most donors to sperm banks are non-Jews. OK, OK, so um, thank you very much for your focus and attention. I really appreciate it. Nice to see people uh, next week. Be'ezrat Hashem, we will go on to the issue of conjoined twins for the last of the three. Uh, in the meantime, I wish you a, uh, a healthy, happy week. You should all stay well and uh, we'll see each other. Please go next week. Thank you very much. All the best. Have a great week.